Hello lovelies, in this video the Brilliant Dog Redbirds is going to go through sequencing and genome projects. This is a fascinating, fascinating topic, so take this slowly and make really careful notes as you get through. So in this video we're going to have a look at genome projects and sequencing. So everything we're going to talk about in this kind of topic section about genetic technologies relies on us being able to understand the human genome or the genome of any organism that we're looking at because we need to know the sequence of the DNA in order to be able to figure it out, understand it, know and find certain genes and what sequences they are, and then use that to help figure us code what they code for in terms of proteins. So we've looked at the genome before and we know should know that that's all of the genetic information in an organism or in a cell. So genome projects are just technology and projects that use technologies to determine the complete sequence of bases that make up the DNA of an organism. So it's about sequencing the entire genome of an organism so we know all of the bases in the order that they exist in. The main example for this, and we will have probably talked about this at GCSE as well, is the Human Genome Project. So it was a collaborative effort of scientists all over the world. They sequenced 3.2 billion bases which is obviously a lot. Previously, up until this point, the most that we managed to sequence in one go or in sort of in a chain was about 10,000. As a result, we now understand and know the sequence of the human genome. We can diagnose and treat diseases and we would never have been able to do that without understanding and knowing these sequences. We can now try and trace causes of inherited diseases and they can be found in days. So we can look for mutations in days instead of trying to understand it and figure out what mutations were causing that, which could have taken years beforehand. So this is a timeline. It took from 1990 all the way to 2003 to actually achieve this. But now genomes are sequenced in a couple of days. So genomes of other organisms, because of the technology advancements that happened during this time and the collaborative effort of everyone working on this technology, the technology has come forward so quickly and so fast, a sort of exponential increase in the abilities of the technology that we were using throughout this time, that now we can sequence things even faster. What is the use of this? Why do we try and sequence genomes? Well, apart from the medical uses that we've said, so being able to diagnose and treat diseases, identifying mutations that cause disease, that's really important. But also we can start comparing sequences between species or within species, and you can highlight where you might see mutations and then they cause disease, so kind of predicting or looking for mutations, but also comparing genomes that can be used to explain the evolutionary relationships between species. So that building of those phylogenetic trees that we've looked at and the idea of how we identify who's related to who and that change in DNA over time that led to these new species, well, we needed to be able to know what the DNA is, sequences are to be able to compare them. And this is the only way we can do it, is by sequencing genomes. We are able to, once we have sequenced the genome, look at proteome sequencing. So we talked about the proteome before. The proteome is the sequence of proteins that's coded for by the DNA base sequence. So it's all of the proteins that can be coded for by your genome. This is only simple. So working out the proteome is only simple in organisms with small genomes, such as bacteria and viruses, because they do not have the non-coding sections of DNA. So the base sequence can be exactly translated into the amino acid sequences. So they don't have introns and exons, they just have exons, or, or they just have DNA that codes for things, all of their DNA codes for something. So it's helped to identify antigens of viruses, and then they can be used to produce vaccines much faster, monitor mutations and variations as the pathogen evolves. We've all been exposed to that um, and tracking of mutations and variants over the last few years. And they also able, enable us to identify antibiotic resistance mechanisms in bacteria. So being able to track the genomes of bacteria and look for differences in their genes that could code for resistance to certain antibiotics. So obviously this is much harder in complex organisms like humans because we have large sections of the genome that's made up of non-coding DNA, introns. In humans, it's actually 98.5%. So it's very little of our genome that is actually coded for all codes for proteins. 
The rest of it is often referred to as junk DNA, although it does have some functions. So there's genes in there that code for tRNA and R, um, so tRNA and ribosomal RNA, so it's how we code for ribosomes. And obviously they are functional proteins. They don't, and um, they don't have, they have specific roles. And so um, that's why it's sort of suggested that that is coding for functional things rather than other proteins. Some is left over from thousands of years of repeat infections with retroviruses. So every time we've been infected with a virus, then their DNA gets integrated into our DNA, and then that obviously stays and gets passed on to offspring. So over millions of years of this happening to all organisms being infected with viruses, there's a lot of viral DNA in there that's kind of left over. It's not really doing anything. It's just dormant. It might just be left over in, from a viral infection. This means that the protein of an organism is hard to determine from the genome, as it's unknown which sections are exons and which ones are introns. So we don't know which bits code and which bits don't. Work still being done on the human protein. So far, we've got more than 30,000 human proteins and we've identified them, but we obviously haven't got anywhere close to um, knowing and understanding what all of that sequence codes for and what it produces. So we need to kind of be able to say that over time, DNA sequencing methods have improved. So the first ever method for sequencing could only do fragments of DNA up to 900 base pairs. The fragments were then aligned based on portions that overlapped to assemble large pieces of DNA. And this method was used to sequence the human genome. Bear in mind, we ended up sequencing millions and millions of base pairs, not just nine, only doing it 900 at a time. So this was very long and labor intensive. You had to split the DNA into four, and then each portion replicated with a different radioactive nucleotide, so the fragments could be detected and then separated by gel electrophoresis, and then an X-ray taken of the gel by hand to view the fragments. So this was a very, very long, very slow process. Uh, and over time, faster sequencing methods now exist in more recent time, and they're continuing developing to become more efficient, more powerful, and cost-effective. So the old methods were labour intensive, they were very, very expensive, and they could only be done on a small scale. Whereas now we have automated machines and computers which can work much faster than humans can. Uh, they're cheaper, so human, whole human genome sequencing is now only costing around a thousand pounds. It may even be less than that. And you can send away one of those test swab kits to get some of your, your DNA sequenced and then, or checked for various genes for ancestry reasons or health reasons, that costs you about 100, 100 pounds. They're more cost effective to do large scale. So we do things on a large scale now rather than doing them on a small scale. And that means doing large scale projects like the Human Genome Project can also be done much easier and faster. So this is an example of one of the more up-to-date cycle sequencing methods that was used. It was developed after the Sanger method, which was that method we were talking about used for the Human Genome Project and it was just kind of updated and made slightly better and faster. So in our reaction mixture, we have primers that are able to bind to the DNA. And then we have our template DNA, which is obviously what we're trying to sequence. And then we have these special nucleotides. So the synthetic nucleotides have a fluorescent tag on them. So there's four different colors here. We've got orange, blue, green, and pink. And then we have DNA polymerase enzyme, which is going to add these nucleotides and also normal nucleotides, non-synthetic nucleotides, to the DNA strand after where the primer is bound to. So it adds nucleotides until it adds one of the fluorescent nucleotides. When it adds a fluorescent nucleotide, it stops. And so that fluorescent nucleotide becomes the end or the terminal nucleotide in the sequence. So you can see here I've got loads of different fragments and each at the end of each one is a different fluorescent tag. So that ends with a different base. This is done repeatedly. So we get all of those fragments built up and then we send those fragments through a very, very thin capillary gel, capillary tube, and it separates them by size. So the smallest ones will go first and the largest ones will go last because due to separation techniques, much like chromatography or gel electrophoresis, which we're going to look at. The laser they have to pass through reads or detects the colour of the fluorescence of the terminal end piece. So in the first of my shortest fragments, I've only got one fluorescent nucleotide. That's the first letter. So then the next letter where there's one nucleotide and then the fluorescent letter, then that's the next letter of the base. And so on and so on and so on. So then we can then build up this sequence 
where we put all the fragments in the right order so we know what the sequence of bases are. And you can do that up to a certain base size, base number size, but it's quite large. And so you can simple like this, and it produces this output really where you get the peaks of the uh, chromatograph that we say we call it, but it's kind of really a readout of the peaks that the laser read of the colors of the spectrum. And then that determines which letter it is, and they'll tell you your sequence. And you can send samples away from the lab and they can sequence it and they'll send you back the readout quite cheaply now, depending on how many samples you're doing or how long the base pairs are of the fragment that you're looking at. But this is a really easy way of kind of sequencing DNA. Okay, so that's quite a short one about genome products and sequencing. You need to know what these products are about, how they work. The, se the sequencing, you don't need to go into so much detail, but you may get given a sequence to read, or you may get given the context around using sequencing in order to get or know or understand the base sequence of a section of a genome or the whole genome. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches.